The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, the National Center on Caregiving Staff Development Series today for our first webinar, Caregiving 101, Explain the Complexities of Family Caregiving. I'm Kathleen Kelly, Executive Director of Family Caregiver Alliance and the National Center on Caregiving in San Francisco. The National Center on Caregiving at Family Caregiver Alliance is located in San Francisco and has as its, as its mission to advance the development of high-quality, cost-effective policies and programs for caregivers in every state. Family Caregiver Alliance has also worked directly with family caregivers through the Caregiver Resource Center in the greater San Francisco Bay Area for over 30 years. We're honored to be partnering in these trainings and technical assistance efforts with our colleagues at ARCH National Respite Network and Resource Center. Our technical assistance centers for caregivers, programs, and lifespan respite support the aging network and respite programs. They are better equipped to serve older adults and their caregivers. The centers provide access to practical tools and multimedia, maintain two robust, robust uh, websites with national databases of respite and model caregiver support programs and materials, policy updates and best practices, sponsor specialized trainings, and provide individual technical support. The technical assistance centers are funded by the Administration on Aging. Caregiving 101, Exploring the Complexities of Family Caregiving, is the first component in our staff development series. The series contains the basic knowledge and skills needed to effectively work with caregiving families. Our second component, Why Assess Caregivers, followed with the practice of caregiver assessment, will be offered in early 2011. Our staff development series will follow the knowledge and competency recommendations resulting from the State of the Science Symposium that brought together leaders in social work and nursing in 2008. This effort and additional implementation activities is funded by the John A. Hartford Foundation. The staff development series is provided as a staff training resource for the provider community. All of our webinars will be archived along with materials so organizations can use them in the future. Before we get started, I do want to point out to your phones have been muted and will remain muted for the entire presentation. If you have questions or comments, please type them into the box on your toolbar. We have a scheduled time at the end of the webinar for questions. If we don't get to your questions while we are still live, unanswered questions will be posted on our website. You will also receive a follow-up email with a brief survey about the webinar. We would appreciate your feedback, and it should not take more than a few minutes to complete. I'm delighted to see such a huge response to the issue of family caregiving. I think this represents the tremendous need we all have to search, and, to search for and locate current information about family caregivers. Next slide. I'm very excited to hear from our presenter, Donna Shemp, today of the complexities surrounding family caregivers. Donna has worked in the field of aging for the over 20 years as in the field of home care and hospice as a social worker. And for 10 years, she was the program director for Family Caregiver Services at Family Caregiver Alliance. I now am going to turn over the presentation to Donna Shemp. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Um, our goal for today is to talk about um, how you, um, in your work, and as you proceed for in caring for your clients, um, to incorporate caregivers. So the goal of this training is to provide participants understanding of the potential impacts care providing has on family caregivers. Family caregivers are often ignored or just seen as adjunct, and we want to see them as an integral part of caregiving and care care for the care receiver. Um, we're hoping that you will, at the end of this presentation, have an overview of who and what family caregiving is, who the what the challenges are that are faced by caregivers, the barriers faced by caregivers, what some of the emerging issues are, and the caregiving rewards. Because much as we're going to concentrate on some of the negative parts, there's a lot of reasons why people are doing caregiving. 
and then to look at what the resources are. So the first section is the overview of family caregivers. That's what is caregiving, who are the caregivers, the definitions, self-identity, and statistics. So what is caregiving? Caregiving takes many forms, and a lot of people do not um, think of themselves as caregivers because they think, I'm just doing this. But anyone who has helped older, chronically ill, or disabled family member um, is probably being a caregiver. Uh, many of these people do not think of themselves as caregivers because I'm just a mother, or I'm just a daughter, or I'm just a spouse, or I'm just a neighbor, or just a friend. But if one is buying groceries, cooking, cleaning house, doing the laundry, spending time, you know, the amount of time it takes to just make doctor's appointments, taking people to the doctor, um, making sure the medication and making sure there's enough medications available, coordinate care, who's going to be doing what, when, um, or doing personal care, getting dressed or shaving or doing a haircut or helping someone take a shower. All those are the tasks of caregivers. Um, and um, what happens is that people need to take on responsibility in a way that they hadn't, and it's usually very gradual. So I just, you know, I, I, I took mom to the store to do her grocery shopping, and so therefore I'm not a caregiver. But those things gradually, gradually increase, and that's part of what helps someone kind of fall into caregiving without knowing uh, what's happening. And people are just kind of making it up. Um, they're just kind of doing it without thinking about it. So who are these caregivers? Obviously, there's the partners or the spouses, the adult children, um, and adult children, by the way, is a complicated concept because with remarriage, we often have, you know, the adult children of one spouse, the adult children of another spouse, and maybe the adult children of both of uh, them as a couple. So we have his, hers, and our. And who is your biological parent versus who's a step-parent can be a huge difference in what caregiving roles are accepted by people. A parent can be taking care of a disabled adult child. Um, that can be someone with a traumatic brain injury, someone who's had a stroke or other illnesses. Um, you know, other relatives, so siblings can often be taking care of each other. Friends, best friends, neighbors, people like that might be the person who all is doing the caregiving. And you'd be surprised how often it's things like neighbors, ex-in-laws, um, anyone um, who has you know, chosen to get involved. Um, a third of the caregivers are men, and we often think of caregiving as a female career. It's not, it's often a, um, it's often the men are also involved, and we have to remember to acknowledge them. Family caregivers, I want to just give a definition. The family caregiver is an relative partner friend or neighbor who has significant personal relationship with and provides a broad range of assistance for an older person or an adult with a chronic or disabling condition. Now, that also could be short term, for instance, someone who's just been in a hospital um, and, needs to, and comes home and is needing some extra help. But mostly we're going to be talking about people who are doing this over the long haul for years. And that has to do with the increased chronic illness um, in um, people who are currently aging. The care recipient is an adult with a chronic illness or disabling condition or an older person who needs ongoing assistance with everyday tasks to function on a daily basis. And so that would include people like frail elders. You know, it used to be cocktail conversation, cocktail party conversation about finding daycare, and now it tends to be about what, you know, what's happening with your aging parents. So um, I want to, I can't emphasize strongly enough the whole concept of self-identity. Um, we have to help family caregivers recognize that that's what they are doing. And so we need to give them the name that they are being a caregiver. Because without identifying that, they don't know to look for resources. Um, and so family or friends think of themselves only in terms of the relationship and not in terms of this new role, which is that of the caregiver. Um, so as professionals, it's our job to help them know that 
they are a caregiver, and then to help them identify what that means, what, why are they in here, what is it that they are doing. When they don't identify, they have more isolation. Um, when we get a group of caregivers together, the most often response we get is, I thought it was just me. So helping caregivers have this label, actually in this case it's one of those times when labeling is really helpful because it lets them know that there is support out there and that there is something that they're doing. So 29% of households in the U.S. are providing care for an elderly person in any 12-month period. So that's a third of all adult households are, are doing this caregiving. 73% um, of workers report that they are currently providing or have recently provided care for someone over the age of 18. You can understand then what this may mean for the workforce because if you're having to take time off from work to arrange doctor's appointments or to take care of somebody, they have, they've had a crisis, that increases absenteeism and creates a lot of other problems. Flexibility in the workplace in terms of your ability to take time off is also really important. California has a paid family leave and some other states have similar things. But allowing caregivers some flexibility um, increases the ability of workers to stay in the workforce. 62% have reported having to rearrange the work schedule, decrease their hours, or have had to take a leave. And I might add, or have quit their jobs. And we're going to talk about some of the implications of that later. An estimated 10.9 million family members and friends provide unpaid care for a person with Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. This is 12.5 billion hours of care, which is, averages out to 22 hours a week. So if you're thinking of working a 40-hour week job, on top of that doing 22 hours a week of caring for somebody else, you can understand why caregivers are stressed. 21% of caregivers live in the same household as the person for whom they provide care. This obviously creates strain on relationships with spouses, adult children, family, friends, and other people. One of my clients is caring for a 91-year-old mother who has onset of dementia. So she has to cook for her, feed her, spend the night because she's not safe being alone. And now her 58-year-old husband has just been diagnosed with dementia. And he's still working, so he works swing shift. Between caring for her mother and working for herself, um, she basically never sees the husband who now is going to need more care. You can understand the kind of juggling that she is going to have to do. The value services provide an informal caregiver um, is estimated at $375 billion annually, which is more than the total that is spent in the whole United States for Medicare in 2007. So you can see that it's an essential part of the long-term care um, system in the United States. Challenges of caregiving, we have both the direct care, which is what you do on a daily basis, the fact that caregivers are at higher levels of stress. I want to identify some of the common stressors so you can understand better who the family caregivers are, to talk about what the caregivers' needs are, um, how to help caregivers with self-care, and what some of the ongoing issues are. So one of the things that happens is the caregivers off, the care receiver is often having pain and it's untreated. Sometimes we don't understand why there are be, there's a behavioral issue with someone with dementia or even someone who has like arthritis and they're not complaining about the pain and so we're not understanding that the pain is there. Making sure that there is good pain control is an essential part of caregiving. Um, there's a client we had who was one of those screamers who was always going, help me, help me, help me. And the doctor said that they, um, you know, well, they were older, they probably had some arthritis because most people do and maybe they had a little bit of pain. Well, actually not until they died did we find out that they had a compression, compression fracture of the spine. Because they were old, frail, and had dementia, no one was really checking out what was really going on for them. We need to teach communication skills because, again, particularly dealing with dementia, it's counterintuitive. But family members also have a given skill set on how they communicate within that particular family. And sometimes families need to learn new communication skills in dealing with caregiving and dealing with someone who now has a um, 
a chronic illness. Um, a client talked to me the other day, and what they're doing is they're threatening the father with having to go to a nursing home and lecturing him because he won't take a bath. Well, what that's doing, of course, is just scaring him. And they don't know any other way to try to get him to bathe because they haven't been taught the skills. So these skills can be taught, and resources are available, but people don't know where to go to get them. So, for instance, again, using dementia as an example, you can go to the Alzheimer's Association, and there's all kinds of information, but people aren't going there, and they don't know to go there. Or what you do when someone who has diabetes is, you know, sneaking sugar or other kinds of behaviors that are, can be a problem. Also, without proper training, the caregivers can hurt themselves. You know, most every caregiver I've talked to is making it up on how to transfer someone. Well, if you don't know how to get someone out of a chair or from a chair to a wheelchair, um, the chance that you're going to hurt your own back is going to be very, very high. And back problems is one of the main complaints we hear from caregivers. So without that training, they don't know how to take proper care of themselves so that, in fact, they will be able to continue caregiving. And also by not knowing it, they're hurting the person that they're supposed to be trying to help. So if I don't know how to properly transfer someone, it's going to hurt them when I try to lift them, and it's going to hurt me. So um, the caregivers, again, are making it up. And I've often talked to uh, optional therapists, physical therapists, who are in there trying to do rehab for somebody, teaching them walking or going up and down the stairs or something, and I'll talk to the physical therapist and say, have you trained the family member? And the, you know, the answer is no. They haven't even talked to the family member because their job is to deal with the care receiver. The caregiver doesn't have the skills. They're not going to be able to continue to care for that person. So we've got to find ways for the specialists to go into the home under home care or the hospital before the discharge planning is done to help the caregivers learn the skills they need to be able to help them. One caregiver I know refused to bring her husband home because she had recently had surgery on her knee, well, knee placement. So she wasn't able to, re, um, to transfer him. And she said, you know, until he can get out of bed by himself, I can't take him home because I can't do anything. But no one had asked her what her situation was. They were just saying, it's time to discharge him. 14% of caregivers rate the physical drain of caregiving as high, and 31% rate the emotional stress of caregiving as high. And I want you to look at that because the emotional stress, which is really what we're going to be talking a lot about, is you know, twice, two and a half times higher than the physical strain. Family caregivers are providing care for five years or more, and those people are reporting higher of health as being fair or poor. Now remember, if you're an 80-year-old woman caring for your 85-year-old husband and you've been doing this for five years, you also are now going to be 85. So just by definition of doing this over time and being elderly, the opportunity for more other health issues to interfere is great. So you know, the caregivers are not static in those five years, and so they're dealing with their own issues um, and their own health by virtue of doing caregiving for many years. Family caregivers ex experiencing extreme stress have been shown to age prematurely. This level of stress can take as much as 10 years off of a family caregiver's life. And about 11% of family caregivers report that caregiving has caused their physical health to deteriorate. You know, we might add to that the loss of a social life, emotional support, um, and you know, the fact that no one wants to hear about it. You know, we often ask caregivers, who do you talk to when you're having a bad day? And they say no one. So I just wanted to give you an overview of some of the, the stressors that caregivers themselves report. One of the hardest ones is, of course, the care receiver who doesn't want any help and can do it themselves, thank you, and I don't need anyone to help me. Um, so they're not making it easier for the caregiver trying. The long-distance caregiver who's trying to manage everything from afar and can't go that often to go see someone, but is ultimately the person who's responsible. There's a lot of family disagreements um, around what kind of care is appropriate, who should be doing what, and how it should be done. My families was in disagreement about whether the mother should have an organic 
vegetarian diet or not and whether or not the medications were appropriate or not. So families can disagree in all kinds of ways about what is appropriate. We've talked about the physical care needs. Just the fact that the change is happening, and change happens all the time, and none of us are good at handling change. Change is one of those things that just makes it hard for us. Um, uncertainty, not knowing what the future holds, not knowing what each day is going to hold, how the person's going to be. A lot of people have good days and bad days, makes it very hard. Um, the medical care not responding to the caregiver, we're going to talk about that later. But the, also the medical care not being able to either fix problems. Um, and the next one says money, and it says not enough, but it's also, it also can be easily family fights over money, who controls it, who has the power. The legal matters, how things are going to be divided up, who does the work versus who's going to inherit the money. Whether or not someone can live at home, either live at home independently or live at home with a family member, or whether there needs to be a move to more supportive housing. Um, what are the supervision needs? Often family members disagree on how help is needed, or the caregiver and the care receiver disagree on how much help is needed. And generally, the caregiver thinks more help is needed, and the care receiver thinks less help is needed. Or the care receiver thinks that if I'm going to get help, it should come from my family and is not open to other sources of help. Um, you know, how do you deal with things like someone who shouldn't be driving anymore? Um, or the refusal to um, go to the doctor or to accept the treatment that the doctor has said. The concerns about things like stairs in the house or throw rugs and other kinds of things that make it unsafe for one to be at home. And also people who aren't taking their medications regularly or breaking the medications in half so as not to take so much because it won't cost so much. And then, you know, the caregivers are processing their own feelings. They may have a lot of frustration and anger. I might add to their resentment that they're doing this. Often there's a lot of guilt, and we're going to talk more about the fact that caregivers also have increased depression. And I just wanted to share a cartoon with you, which you can read on your own. But, you know, it's the fact that, you know, if you're always rushing somewhere, um, it's hard to sometimes get to want to go. Um, so the challenges of caregiving, and I call this the IRS of caregiving, because all caregivers need information, respite, and support. Um, but the responsibilities also change as the condition changes. This is not a static situation. And the first stages of caregiving are the most demanding because this is when caregivers are the least informed, when they're making it up the most. They don't know what is needed or expected, and you know they end up feeling um, unconfident, uncomfortable, and insecure, and uncertain about what to do. Um, you know, it's one of the things that caregivers will talk about is the respite breaks that they need from caregiving. Um, they don't have a chance to have a life outside of caregiving often, and sometimes when we give people respite breaks, one of the things they'll say is. I was just relieved just to sleep through the night because they haven't had that chance to have an undisturbed night to sleep. We don't even think about what that means. Caregivers need to know that their feelings count. You know, they don't ha think that they have the right to say, I can't, do I can't do this anymore. Although I have to say that when people call family caregiver lines, the most common first sentence is, I'm calling you because I can't do it anymore. Um, they need to know that their feelings are important and they have a right to a full range of feelings from happiness to glad to scared to angry to frightened. All of their feelings are, are relevant, are appropriate, and need to be acknowledged. And they also need to take care of their own health. Um, they have a right to ask questions and be listened to. They need to get information about community resources. And particularly the biggest frustration is getting the medical system to pay attention to them and what their concerns are. Caregivers have a right to not be abused or ignored. And um, the abuse generally comes from the care receiver, um, but it also can come from um, other family members or the system who isn't paying, again, isn't paying attention to them. We actually had a care receiver who was in hospice care and had a history of being abusive in his marriage and ended up in jail on hospice because he was continuing to abuse his caregiver. So things like that can happen. 
But caregivers also need us to be the ones who tell them they can't do it alone. So we need to help them identify where their support is. And people say, well, I have no one. And then we can talk to them about aunts, uncles, cousins, neighbors, friends, you know, faith community, that there are, is help out there, volunteer support programs, friendly visitors, to help them identify where, in fact, there might be a source of support. One of the other things that caregivers need to do is to learn how to say yes when people do help. When we ask caregivers, well, has anyone offered to help, they'll say, well, yeah, and I said, and what to say in response? They say, oh, I'm okay, it's okay, I'll let you know. Um, we need to help them find where to get help, like where do you get diapers or where do you get um, durable medical equipment, where do you get adaptive clothing, where's the cheapest place to get medications because money may be a problem. Um, they need to know about things like paratransit and meals on wheels, daycare centers, um, because you know the daycare center is not the same as the senior center and then maybe the only thing that they ever know about is that um, the senior center, and the senior center says, well, this person can't come anymore because they're not able to there independently. Um, we had one doctor, I have to just tell this as an aside, in terms of getting the medical system to pay attention to him, whose husband was up and wandering all night, and she actually had paid help at night so that she had some sleep, but there was enough noise that he created that she wasn't getting enough sleep. And the doctor said, well, if she just had a bigger house, then she'd be able to get asleep, so this wasn't really an issue. Um, so, you yeah, we have to understand that, that, you know, caregivers need to have us help positively solve their problem. Some of the challenges of caregiving is that caregivers have a higher morbidity and mortality, which means that they get sick more and they die sooner. And that continues five to seven years after they stop being a caregiver. Um, there's been research done that shows that caregivers have higher cortisol levels than non-caregivers. It's what makes them more vulnerable to illness and injury. You know, the physical strain we've talked about, like back care. Um, you know, caregivers do their own preventive care. They'll, they often put it off. They either say, I don't have time or, you know, I can't leave my loved one. And so, therefore, they aren't getting the chance to get to the doctor for themselves. One of my caregivers died of cancer. She knew she had cancer, but didn't go to the doctor because she knew she wouldn't be able to do the treatment and take care of him. Well, then she died, and of course, he ended up in a nursing home, which is what she was trying to prevent. Um, juggling many roles, working, um, and taking care of the, someone. The sandwich generation, meaning I have a, you know children at home, I'm working, and I'm caring for an elderly parent. Teenage children often um, have hostility toward the um, grandparent who's taking away their parent um, or are embarrassed by the um, care receiver who the grandparent who um, may be doing things or looking in ways that are hard for them. So it makes it also very, very hard for the caregiver to meet the needs of everybody. Um, the interventions have been shown to make these things better. Um, Ten sessions of counseling have been shown to um, postpone nursing home placement by six to 12 months. Um, caregivers often need to feel rewarded, and it can be really hard if the care receiver is not appreciative. Uh, we need to teach them coping strategies on to take care of themselves. And also, we have to address issues of substance abuse because um, caregivers are often using either medication, alcohol, or other substances to help them cope because they don't have other coping um, mechanisms. Also, um, eating the wrong foods can be another way that caregivers are taking care of themselves. And then finally, sleep deprivation. The common issue of not being able to sleep through the night or get a whole evening sleep is major. Caregivers will often say that they, you know, it's only after everyone's in bed and everything's that they have a minute for themselves. We have an online support called Link to Care, and the most common time for people logging on to that is midnight, so you can understand what caregivers are going through. So caregivers, 40 to 70 percent of family caregivers have clinically significant symptoms of depression, and a quarter of those actually meet the criteria for major depression. Caregiving is one of the undertreated side effects of being a caregiver. 
just again acknowledging to caregivers that they may be having depression and 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 it's often shows up as anxiety, not sadness, and so people think they're not depressed, but actually the anxiety is part of their depression. And nearly three quarters of family caregivers report not going to the doctor as often as they should, while 55% say they skip doctor appointments for themselves. 63% of caregivers report having poor eating habits than non-caregivers. What they're doing is they're stress eating or eating whatever's handy, or they'll veg out uh, when they have downtime and just nibble. And of course, they aren't finding time to exercise. Um, so here's another cartoon, which again says, if you don't relax um, now and then, your head will fall off. Um, caregivers, ongoing issues. Um, you know, the, we often as professionals think of our client as the care receiver, and we think of the care receiver only, and not seeing the care receiver in context with the so, um We don't take the caregiver's input into consideration. Um, and the caregiver and care receiver can have very, very different perceptions of what's going on. And as a professional, we've got to kind of balance those two. And I can just give a, a very common story, a uh, yeah, personal story about that. My husband had a herniated disc in his back, and we took him to the doctor, and I had him in a wheelchair because he couldn't walk. And the doctor said on a scale from 1 to 10, what is your pain level? And he said 6, 7, and I said 11, 12. And yeah, this is the kind of thing that we have to figure out, which is what is really going on with somebody. Um, the, you know, the rehab is generally emphasized on physical functioning, but we're understanding whether the care receiver itself is having depression or having other behavior or agitation issues. And so they may be functioning physically fine, but there may be issues that the caregiver is having to deal with. And you know, as a system, we have generally um, concentrated on poor, isolated seniors rather than the seniors that are, in fact, in families. Lack of social support, caregivers um, have a less sense of well-being when they are isolated, when they don't have anyone to talk to, and they aren't out and about with things and doing things that are fun. One of my caregivers, I said, when's the last time you laughed? And she looked at me in quite in shock and said, I've for, forgotten how to laugh. So we have to remember that we need to help them to have um, a sense of that, that, that respite break, that chance of something outside of caregiving. Um, and those who are dealing with someone with dementia um, get the least support because everybody around them doesn't understand it any more than they don't understand it, and it's hard to care, include that person. So the, also the cost of long-term care, um, you know, people are often discharged from the hospital earlier and sicker um, because it's not reimbursed, and that care often falls on the caregiver to do at home. Um, the caregivers don't know what to expect or how to care for the patient. When we ask them when um, it's been discharged, again, what skills have they been taught? Um, generally, they haven't been taught anything. They haven't been taught transfer skills. They haven't been taught... Um, you know, how to, um, you know, change, how to do wound care, how to change a catheter, anything that they may be asked to do. And um, again, the needs of these caregivers are not taken into consideration. You know, caregiving puts a huge strain on marital relationships, often leading to divorce. Um, families end up not talking to each other. Um, so the caregiver often loses their family as a result of caregiving. And then they don't, again, have appropriate knowledge of the medical care task. So outside of wound care, transfer skills, dental care, changing diapers, um, those are the things are not addressed for the caregiver. Um, and then the care receiver doesn't want to be a burden, and so they will also under, um, sometimes under or under let people know what they need. Um, you know, there's, the caregivers need to know what they can and can't control. What if the care receiver won't take their medicine, or they won't wear a CPAP if they sleep apnea, or they're getting up out of the chair without using their cane or walker? All those things are the frustrations that the caregiver is facing. Caregivers face a number of burdens, um, education, the system not responding to them, isolation, not having the informal support they need. There are trust issues, financial issues, legal issues. Um, and then there's own self-care issues and guilt and grief and loss. 
Um, so information on the illness. Caregivers are amazingly uneducated about what the illness is they're dealing with, and um, they're not taught things like communication skills, what happens to this disease over time. Our medical system is an acute illness medical model, and most people in, today and going forward are going to be dealing with chronic illness, which has a whole different set of needs, and a whole different set of needs for the care receiver and a whole different set of needs for the caregiver because they're going to be doing this over time. Um, families often are involved in power struggles and not knowing um, because they don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, and we need to um, deal with the care strategies, again, how do they take care of themselves, and also understanding the behavioral issues. Um, we, we, we treat people kind of the way they've always been when now they're different, and we don't know how to deal with this difference in who, who the care receiver is. Um, caregivers often don't know how to talk to the the doctors or other professionals and getting them how to listen. You know, I hear things like the caregiver going to the doctor and, and talking about a certain behavior and the doctor will say, well, I don't see it or it's not happening here, and not taking the caregiver seriously and the caregiver not knowing how to advocate for themselves. Also, they are not system savvy. So um, one of my clients recently got turned down for Social Security disability and didn't know that everybody gets turned down for Social Security disability and that they had to appeal. So even though he'd applied five times, he had never appealed and didn't know that that's what he had to do. Um, so they don't know about the community resources and the things that are out there that are available for them. And then how to access those services, how to get the services to respond to them, um, how to get a call back when you're not getting your call back. Um, and then also not, not only not knowing about you know, community resources such as Meals on Wheels or Power Transit Daycare, but also about things like confusing community resources with welfare. So I don't want to take any welfare. We don't, we're not that kind of family. We've talked about caregivers getting more and more isolated, and they often feel very abandoned. Um, some of them, they do their own isolation, but also people drop away. If you're not available and you're not there to, you know, go out to the movies or go to dinner or something, People stop calling, um, and or they feel they stop relating to other people because they say no one wants to hear about it. Um, caregivers are, are particularly bad at not knowing how or who to ask for help, and yeah, you know, they don't know how to say what it is they want and need. Family conflict is huge among family caregivers. Yeah, you know, there's a return to family of origin. You know, I live in California. Lots of people have moved 3,000 miles away and they're brought back into that family and having to deal with it. Loss of social support um, is back to that isolation and not being out and about and doing things. Sibling issues come up. Um, sex role behavior. Physical limitations. So chronic illness of the caregiver. The caregiver can have things wrong with them, not only the care receiver. Um, I had one caregiver who was in a wheelchair trying to take care of her mother who was 96 and had dementia, so she had to deal with her own issues as well as her mother's. We've talked about depression, and I really want to talk about substance abuse and prescription abuse because a lot of people are using alcohol or medications for sleeping, um, if nothing else, and that's causing their own issues. Also, yeah, there's been the change of the relationship with the caregiver. This was my, my mother was my best friend. And now I'm the caregiver, I may not be able to get my friendship needs met in the way I had planned, I had always done for my mother. Um, you know, this is, you know, social supports can also come through um, support groups and online support groups and other ways that people can get connected to other caregivers. And this is just a card to let you understand that, you know, that social support, having someone to talk to is really important for caregivers. So for informal supports, the feeling of isolated and being alone um, increases with the length of time as a caregiver. And just to use dementia or Alzheimer's disease as an um, example, people have Alzheimer's usually three years before diagnosis and five to 20 years after diagnosis. 
so we're not just dealing with the here and now. And we can all gear up for a six-month kind of crisis situation, you know, post-hospitalization or something. But when they go on for a long time, the caregiver has to learn different coping skills and pace themselves differently than they would. Um, and what happens is that caregivers often go into caregiving starting in that kind of crisis mode, and they don't know then how to gear down for the long haul. Uh, the eight percent of caregivers feel they need more help or information, and it's a lot about the the disease as well as what's out there for them. You know, the found conflict is often a problem, which we've already mentioned. Um, you know, it's not going to bear. One person in the family usually does most of the caregiving, and that re leads to resentment. There's also issues around male female roles, and what is allowed to you know who's allowed to do what or who does do what in a given family. Um, and if we can get families to use support, um, they, caregivers will take better care of themselves and, as a result, take better care of the care receiver. Our ethnic and cultural issues, particularly around trust issues, um, but again, about what sex roles or um, birth order or what men do, what women do, different kinds of, you know, what husbands can do, what wives can do. Um, what happens when you have to take care of an ex opposite sex parent with bathing, childing, dressing? In some cultures and some families that can work, in others it can't. Um, you know, a lot of this is seen as the obligation of adult children to take care of uh, their elderly parents. And you know, we often don't ask the caregiver whether they are willing to give um, care and whether the care receiver is willing to accept care. We also don't allow caregivers to express their ambivalence. Um, I often say to caregivers, how do you get to be the chosen one? Because we don't know, you know, it's how to get in this role. Um, this fear of strangers. We don't want strangers in the house, so we can't use outside help because that would be against what my parents wish. Um, there's that um, fear of being robbed or, you know, something bad's going to happen. Um, you know, a lot of people with dementia are inherently paranoid, and that makes it also hard to get outside help into the house. And people are embarrassed. They're embarrassed that someone needs help. They're embarrassed that they might need help, that they can't do it themselves. The care receiver can be embarrassed. The caregiver is embarrassed. And that is a huge barrier to getting outside help. And then there's, we're not like that. You know, they've never had to ask for help before. They've never accessed systems. And they think that getting help is welfare, and that's against their belief system. This is also a women's issue. If women give up working in order to um, take care of someone or decrease their hours, that not only in decreases their income, but it also decreases the amount of money they're putting into Social Security, which will also affect them when they reach their own old age. And they often also end up having to give up um, their health care, and that's another barrier to not getting the health care they need. And um, this is obviously a second wife who says, you know, if you care so much, how come you've named your daughter to pull your plug? Um, the finances are a big issue, um, and who has control of the finances are a super big issue, because um, finances equal power. Who has control of the money has some power. Um, cost of hiring is really high. You know, in California, it's about $25 an hour. A lot of people don't have that. Because they're too rich to be poor, too poor to be rich, they can't access public benefits like Medicaid and whatever services come with Medicaid. And there's nothing out there for the people just above the Medicaid level. Those are the people who have the highest need because there's the least amount of support. You know, the, often the only asset may be the house, and people don't want to touch the house. The house is very sacred. It's about identity and other things. Um, and, you know, even though reverse mortgages exist, a lot of them um, are reluctant to use that. Um, you know, the bills can become overwhelming. You know, medical care is overwhelming. And, you know, how, how are you going to juggle all these bills is really important. And then, you know, families, particularly elderly people, have worked hard to create this nest egg. You know, they're afraid of running out of money. I often have to say, this is the rainy day you were saving for. Um, yeah, they want their children to inherit the money. That's what they work hard for. Um, conversely, the children really see the money as their inheritance, and they really also are wanting to preserve that money. 
And we also have the depression mentality, which is the people who were raised it in the 30s understand what um, not literally not having any money means. And also when nursing home placement is the only option because that's the only thing paid for under Medicaid, um, you know, that people feel like nursing home is not an option, so they've got to figure out a way to solve this problem. And here's um, the crotchety old man who wants to disinherit everybody. Um, so legally, powers of attorney for health care and finance are so important. Um, people have said, well, I don't need a will because I don't have anything for anyone to inherit. But they don't understand that they maybe need someone with power of attorney finance just to sign on their checking account in order to pay their bills. I'll often say to someone, you know, if you, got, you, know, if you had a stroke and you couldn't sign anymore, even though you have all that money, how are you going to get the, how is someone going to pay your bills if you can't sign your checks? Um, <clears throat> and someone needs to tell people to get this done. No one says, you know, do you have your, you know, durable powers of attorney for health care and finance? Have you had a conversation with your family about what your health care needs are and what you want? Um, because the family is probably going to be the one who's going to have to make these decisions. And I think as professionals, it's our job to help facilitate these conversations. Um, who handles the money is the one who has the power, and that's a core issue is really important to look at in terms of who may be doing the care and who's paying the bills or who's in control of the bills. Um, and the, you know, the caregiver needs to know how to talk with doctors to facilitate getting release of information. Doctors will often say, I can't give you any information because of HIPAA. And what we need to do is we need to talk to the caregiver to get the doctor to facilitate getting that and also to help caregivers know that even if the caregiver can't, the doctor can't give them information, they always receive information. So I encourage caregivers to write the doctor an email or a letter or a fax or a phone call to say this is, you know, you may not be getting this from my mom or dad, but this is what's really going on. So we've talked about the caregivers having problems with the system getting to pay attention to them. Uh, they're not admitting to their own needs um, and not knowing how to receive offers of help. And so telling them that it's really okay, in fact, they need to have this help in order to continue to be a caregiver is part of our role is to really encourage that. Um, dealing with other family members increases the stress often and um, you know, power caregivers often say, I have I just don't have any time to take care of health. And you know, there's a class out there that I don't know if is available in your communities called Powerful Tools for Caregiving. And really a lot of it's about how to create time for yourself. Um, the next is a um, cartoon. And, um, you know, it ends with, can you give me a prescription for hugs? Because actually one of the things that happens to both caregivers and care receivers is both of them stop getting touched. And touch is a really important nurturing piece for all of us. Um, so guilt, I should. You know, one of the things that caregivers go is no one will do as good a job as I do. And the answer is that's true. But they will do a different job. And we need to encourage caregivers to um, allow, you know, someone can do it differently and it will be okay. Um, that, you know, if I leave, something will happen if you're away. And so I have to be the one who's there because magically I'm going to prevent something from happening. And that something is someone will fall or someone will die or something. If I'm there, that's not going to happen. And, um, you know, a lot of people have promised never to put someone in a nursing home. So the whole idea that they that someone they need to be placed that you can't take care of them at home any longer um, is a huge guilt issue. Um, guilt versus regret. You know, sometimes we have to teach people that this is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad disease, whatever it is they're dealing with, which means that they have to make terrible, horrible, no good, bad decisions. And we confuse something that's hard with something that's wrong. And guilt's about wrong. And it may be that this is just very, very hard. And we have to really support people in um, understanding that difference. Caregivers want to be perfect, just like parents want to be perfect. And of course, you can't be perfect. You're going to, you know, sometimes you're going to be impatient. You're going to lose it. You're going to get frustrated. Um, you're going to do something wrong. And caregivers, again, need to learn how to forgive themselves. Um, Caregivers feel like they don't have the right to have a good time or go out and do something if their loved one is suffering. So they say, you know, I can't, I can't do that. You know, 
you know, it's just not fair. If my husband is here and can't have any fun, why, why should I be able to? And thinking about my own needs would be selfish. But the other thing that makes people guilty is they feel ambivalent. One of my friends said, but really, I just wish she would die. And that was a husband talking about his wife because he had gotten so exhausted in caring for her, didn't know him anymore or anything else, and he was really, really, you know, just exhausted, and that was the way he dealt with it. And so we need to let them be able to express that ambivalence. There's also the issue of loss, and grief and loss are a lot of what caregivers are also doing. And one of the things that they're doing is having ambiguous loss because it's the loss that happens before someone dies. We think about loss in terms of death, but we don't think about loss in terms of the loss of the future. A married couple, you know, they've just retired, they had all kinds of thoughts about what was going to happen in the future, and one of them has a health crisis. And so now they're not going to go get that RV and travel around the world for the next year. Um, the loss of who the person was. This was, my again, my best friend, my buddy, my playmate, my mother, my confidant, that person is in that role. Um, you know, we always think our parents are going to live forever, and so, you know, we have the sense of, you know, I always have the right to make it right, or, you know, we can, we can cure this relationship. And then the role, um, both the role of the person who is sick and the, and the caregiver who has to change roles. And we talked about guilt and about being selfish. So now I want to talk about what the emerging issues are. Um, and these are, why is this so important? I mean, we've talked kind of about what the caregiver is going through, but why is this important? And why is it important to recognize family caregivers, uh, what the research is, and what the emerging issues are, and the paradigm shift outside of um, the things that we've already talked about. So families are usually the first choice uh, for how uh, care receivers want to be taken care of. They want to be taken care of in their own home with their family. Um, and so that's who is kind of immediately seen to who's going to step up to the plate. But that care, care comes at a cost to the family, both economically and emotionally. Um, caregivers are often paying for care out of their own funds. They're depleting their IRAs and other things in order to help take care of a family member. Um, and um, you know, there's a high need for mental health services and other care supports for depression. Um, we had a daughter-in-law who lost her job, um, and they had been paying for an attendant for the father, um, the, well, the father-in-law, um, because husband and wife were both working. Now that the daughter-in-law lost her job, they don't have the money to pay for the attendant. But you know, she's not comfortable bathing dad, so how are they going to solve this problem? Um, yeah, you know, the these the the crisis that people are facing other already because of lost job and economic downturn can be exacerbated by caregiving, and also the care the care receivers who have those nest eggs have often lost them due to the downturn in the finances, and that's changed the way long term care is being um, care looked at. So the unit of care is the care receiver and the caregiver, and I think that. Whenever we see elderly people with chronic illness, um, you know, we need to see that they don't exist in isolation, that they are part of a unit, and that both of them need help. Um, if something happens to the caregiver, the care receiver is going to end up compromised. And so the more support we can give the caregiver and the care receiver as a unit, the better both of them are going to be. Um, the caregiver assessment and support needs um, is shown to improve outcomes and the continuity of care for the receiver. So the better we care for the caregiver, the better the care the care receiver is going to get. And if the care receiver does better, the caregiver does better. So it's a circle that feeds on both, um, both of them doing better if we can help both of them. Um, caregiver confidence and competence leads to better outcomes for the care receiver. And really understanding the caregiver situation, including their service needs, their unresolved problems, and their risks, um, is really important for, to meet the needs of the caregiver and to meeting the needs of the care receiver. So we want to identify the services available for the caregiver, and we want to uh, provide appropriate and timely referrals for those services. And we want the resources referrals to be specific and targeted so as not to overwhelm the caregiver. 
uh, you know, care um, resource guides don't really help caregivers because they don't know what to do with them. And so what we want to do with it, um, is to give them a specific place to call and a specific number to call so that they can do it. When we send resources to people, we find out that the caregiver often doesn't even have, the, hasn't had the time to even open the envelope. Um, we need to, um, you know, there is the FCA, Family Caregiver Alliance Innovation Clearinghouse online, which gives evidence-based research on what some of the things are that might be helpful to caregivers. Um, we, um, We want to make sure that um, we get the basic information on the caregiver when we're working with the family. So we need to either have a phone number for the caregiver, an email address, and get proper release and permission to talk to them. Because if we don't have a way to talk to the caregiver, we may not be able to get the rest of the story, or we won't know how, how to take care of the caregiver as well as the care receiver. Um, and here's a, the family issue, which is she's your mother, you tell her. Um, a high amount of research activity in the last 30 years has been um, taking place to deal with intervention to help caregivers. What we want to do is reduce their stress, reduce the burden, and there's the Zara Burden Scale for caregivers. If you haven't seen it, it looks at how burdened a caregiver feels, health and depression, and competency and coping, which is what we're talking about. Um, there's a growing body of research uh, results for evidence and best practices. That's where the um, Innovation Clearinghouse might be really helpful for you. Um, and um, want to replicate these best practices in states and local communities. Um, there's also a growing body of consumer information and online training and resources for community ser service databases that make access to information easier. However, caregivers don't know to go, for instance, to the specific organization, whether it's the American Heart Association, the American Stroke Association, the American Diabetes Association, the Alzheimer's Association. All those associations have a lot of information, and people are, because they're not self-identifying as caregivers, are not going and getting the information that is available to them. And um, here is we have the cockroach, which we know is never going to die. Um, so why now? Why is this coming up now? Well, you know, caregivers are already being served through the VA and, and national and state programs. The Title III E funding um, is a national program that goes to the states that helps to support givers. And as that was implemented, what we found was that senior service systems, like area agencies on aging, had a real problem understanding the switch from the care receiver to the caregiver. And so the more we can see the caregiver as an independent person with needs, the better we're going to be able to take care of them and, again, play the care receiver. Um, we need to assess the caregiver. And even if we just ask a simple question like, are you a caregiver or is someone helping to care for you, then that will also help the caregiver to um, get acknowledged back to the self-identity issue. Chronic illness is the change in the paradigm. And um, you know the medical model is an acute model, acute illness model. So we need to realize that chronic illness takes a whole different skill set. You know, um, Medicare billing and other policy issues is because if we aren't reimbursed, you know, the caregivers, the professionals are saying, I yes, I understand what you're saying. All this needs to be done, but I'm not being reimbursed for it, so I can't afford to do it. So finding reimbursement for professionals to services to caregivers is very important. Um, and I have to tell you the most frequently asked question that comes from caregivers is how to get paid to be a caregiver. Because they, again, have given up financial security in order to do this. Um, so we have to include the caregiver as part of the health care team um, in order to help with care coordination, and medical home care models also have to see the caregiver as an important part of the care team. So they've been mostly ever looked as health partners in the formal system, and what we're wanting to do is to make them an integral part. Um, the visibility of informal caregivers is a major part of the long-term long care workforce, and for whom services and support should be provided is growing as a policy issue. 
the Title III E Fund started, which is the older National Family Caregiver Support Program, started in 2000, 2001, and you know, funding has increased for that. And um, I have to understand that caring for the caregiver actually saves the system money, ultimately. Most long-term care is being provided by families in their home. Caregivers are being woven into evidence of best practices as major components of programs managing chronic care conditions. Care receivers don't exist in isolation. And caregivers are mentioned 16 times in the Health Care Reform Act. So the, the, the new medical paradigm is that the caregiver is an important part of providing care. What I wanted to do is to take a minute to understand caregivers also are being are, do feel rewarded in what they're doing. And this uh, list came from a caregiver retreat where the caregiver said, you know, that this is a chance for me to give back, to feel competent and capable, to feel like I'm doing um, what it is that is expected of me. It's my spiritual fulfillment. I get um, satisfaction in doing a good job. People are there because this is a rewarding experience for them, not only out of obligation, but out of love and out of respect. So in conclusion, I want to talk about the fact that professionals can facilitate caregivers dealing with someone with a chronic illness, understanding the complexities faced by the family caregivers, um, helping them to identify as a caregiver, listening to their concerns and experience. And I have to say that after we do caregiver assessments, the most common thing that we hear from a caregiver is, no one's asked me about me before. Because when we talk to someone who's a caregiver, we're always asking about the care receiver. We're not turning to them and saying, and how are you doing? And also by acknowledging their feelings and encouraging them to seek, assist, seek assistance. I'm now going to turn this talk over to Kathleen Kelly, who's going to talk about uh, resources. Thank you, Donna. Uh, as I mentioned, Donna has been working uh, at Family Care Alliance for over 10 years. And we wanted to shape this particular presentation as to what were the old practical on the ground um, experiences that, that we have had uh, for over 30 years for, from family caregivers. And I think Donna did an admirable job. And I want to make note that the um, slides uh, that we probably had to skip through pretty quickly are, will be along with the archive audio file available on our website uh, after this um, presentation. I want to talk about some of the resources real quickly before we got to questions about the Technical Assistance Center, our Care Navigator uh, fact sheets and so on that you can avail yourself to. Our Technical Assistance Center offers uh, practical tools and support through our clearinghouse. We have a listing of evidence-based interventions, emerging practices, model programs, policy and advocacy tools, and multimedia um, available uh, for those that are working with uh, families in the field or to be able to refer uh, families to. We have over 400 resource listings currently in our Technical Assistance Clearinghouse. And you may also call us for consultation on our 800 number, which is in our contact information at the end of this presentation. I also urge you to subscribe to our bi-monthly um, newsletters, uh, Policy Digest, and also our Technical Assistance Program uh, as well. That you might find those um, uh, very helpful. Our Family Care Navigator is in the process uh, currently of being updated with new information, but basically it's an overview of what's available in terms of publicly funded services, sort of a top of the trees viewpoint to get everyone started to uh, find the information or find the re resource databases that uh, families from all over the country who contact us are really looked for. So there's resources for um, services that are broadly offered and links back to, of course, local um, community databases that serve the family in their own um, local environment. Um, we ha also have um, uh, some information uh, linked to um, consumer information that's provided as an adjunct to looking for services uh, in the community as well. So I'd like to 
just also mention that we have uh, over 50 uh, peer-reviewed fact sheets for consumers, many of which are translated into Spanish and Chinese. And uh, we show uh, a, sort of a sampling of the kinds of information that's available, but they're all available to be downloaded or to be emailed uh, to um, individuals. Uh, they are covering general topics, and uh, most of the topics that we uh, have um, looked at and have uh, written about really come from suggestions uh, from families um, or trends that we see um, in research or uh, trends that we see in our own data. So they're really pra meant to be practical um, fact sheets to, to serve as a way to provide uh, information to families on a consistent basis with vetted sources and trusted information that uh, you as a uh, provider can then follow along and um, emphasize and um, work with families around their individual care issues. I'd now like to move to the, um, the question part of the, um, the session. Uh, and I'm going to uh, ask the questions, and then uh, Donna is going to uh, respond. But um, we do have one question uh, to get us started that says, what do you do uh, for uh, families, or what do you say to caregivers who say that self-care is just one more thing to do on their to-do list? Well, you know, first of all, you have to agree because obviously it is just one more thing to do in the care, not the to-do list. One of the caregiver actually said to me, if one more person says take care of myself, I'm going to scream. Um, but we want them, um, you know, we want to talk to them about what options are for self-care so that they can um, ultimately um, understand that taking care of themselves will actually make their job easier because they'll be more efficient, less stressed, and um, ultimately, they'll be able to take better care of the care receiver. And um, so, you know, that, that's really, um, you know, we have to let them find out how they can do it, um, how can they carve out some time for themselves, as opposed to adding to their stress. We have some questions from our audience. Um, a question around um, why we're uh, including or speaking to uh, caregiving for older adults. Um, this is not strictly speaking um, information that is um, cued for only older adults. I think it's probably um, a little bit more biased because we find in our data that um, at least 70% um, of our uh, families are caring for persons that are over the age of 65. Um, as it pertains to a lifespan project or provision, um, this is a, a, a technical assistance webinar that is um, separate in identity from the Lifespan Respite Project. Um, the Lifespan Respite uh, programs uh, offered under ARCS webinars um, will work in tandem with, um, with our webinar um, uh, programs as well. Donna, would you like to comment about any of the uh, issues around uh, older and younger disabled um, persons and caregivers? The issues actually are the same um, or similar for um, working, w uh, you know, for caregivers who are caring for someone who is younger. Obviously, the issues if you're dealing with a child are are very very different. If you're dealing with an adult, if it's a parent or a sibling dealing with an adult child who's you know, under 65, the same stress and financial issues and other things are still are come into play. We have another question from our audience. Um, I just want to make note of several questions that um, pertain to the PowerPoint slides. We will be uh, posting the PowerPoint slides um, after this we webinar is finished. I would suggest that you wait till tomorrow to um, try to pick up on the PowerPoint slides, but we will have them posted so you'll have them available. There is a question um, from Diane. Can we expect efforts from employers to provide supports for employed caregivers? Oh, I thought Kathy was going to answer that one. We've worked a lot with the workforce, and there's EAP programs. Um, we've tried to get information through things like um, Family Leave Act 
to get um, employers to understand that, for instance, caregivers often need a flexible work schedule, you know, need to be able to make phone calls during the day or maybe need to come in early and leave early so they can take someone to a doctor's appointment. There is, you know, support out there to get employers to pay more attention and sometimes you may have to be your own advocate. I'd like to make note that um, for employers, um, there was, before the recession, the 22 percent of the uh, employer groups, and largely this is large companies, had elder care in their um, employee assistance programs. And since the recession, there's only 11 percent that um, have formal services available. But that doesn't mean that many companies do not uh, informally have um, groups to come out and talk about elder care and caregiver support at sort of brown bag lunches or other informational uh, fairs that they might have. And for those of you who are in the provider community, uh, this is a really excellent way. You, you need to go to the uh, source of where employed caregivers are, and that's in your uh, business community, and perhaps offer to do some informational programs uh, for employers. We find that for caregivers, the number one uh, thing that they would really like their uh, workplace is the flexibility uh, for scheduling um, appointments and be able to have a flexible schedule uh, in their work um, in their work life. Um, so we do have a question about how do you get other siblings in the family to help more, Donna? Well, one of the things that happens in families, again, is that it's not fair and that we know that one person is probably doing more than everybody else. But I also know that um, within families there tends to be a lack of communication on what's going on. First of all, there may be a lack of communication on what the illness is and what needs to be done to uh, truly understand the illness, but the caregiver often also doesn't let everyone else know everything that they're doing. So keeping everyone in the loop about the medical condition, keeping everyone in the loop and what the care needs are is really important. And the, the other thing that family members, particularly the primary caregiver, needs to do is to ask for very specific things, um, like will you help me, but would you drive mom to the doctors on Friday at 3.30? Um, and if you're not going to get support from your family, you need to just find out what other support is available in the community rather than going back to this issue that's not helping you. We have a question about um, caregivers needing training on transfers and um, PT and OT skills. Uh, is training uh, such uh, as this available for uh, versatile by Medicare? And if not, uh, can we do some education to, to make it so? Um, it is reimbursable for Medicare because physical therapy, part of it is training someone to be able to do it under home care. You know, that the physical therapist is to not only there to train the care receiver, the person who is needing the physical therapy, but also to teach the family how to do it. So that is reimbursable. It's just that the family somehow gets lost in the process and we forget to turn to the caregiver and say, what do you need or how can I help you to make this easier for you? Uh, I'd just like to add to that comment. Um, under the um, new provisions within um, health care reform, that we're going to see some of these skills be picked up in uh, transitional services, perhaps care coordination under the medical or health care home. Um, so you might have some of these skills um, incorporated um, as part of, particularly in the transitional services uh, side. For those of you who are um, providers in the community, um, one helpful thing that um, we have found to be enormously useful and very, very popular with um, families is to offer um, you know, workshops or a conference on exactly what are the practical direct skills um, that are <clears throat> needed, excuse me, to uh, provide assistance to um, a family member. And that includes uh, issues around um, trans uh, transitioning uh, out of bed or from a chair and 
um, you know, the, the real direct hands-on kinds of care. We call them caregiver colleges, but they're called many different things. And this is perhaps a good opportunity to partner with hospital or other healthcare system to offer this and market it broadly to the community and also through um, that particular um, healthcare service provider as well. Uh, we have um, a question about how to help those or convince the recipient um, who is in need of help to accept help. This is obviously all one of the most difficult questions. If the person does not have dementia, you know, we have to understand that they have the right to refuse help. But sometimes what happens is that the family member does just enough to keep them from needing to hire help. So sometimes what we have to actually do is back a little um, to let them see what they really do need. Um, if someone does have dementia, they don't have the right, same right to folly or to bad decision because they are obviously can't make a good judgment decision. And this is when learning communication skills and behavioral changes um, you know, have to, um, you know, be brought in. So whether you work with Alzheimer's Association or someone like that to learn the skills to help someone um, accept help. Um, calling in the doctor, I often say it's helpful to call in a higher power and have the doctor write a prescription for help or saying you can't be left alone. Um, you know, learning how to, um, you know, be there, hire help, be there and say it's a friend or this is a volunteer or other ways um, that you might have, bring someone in through the back door would really be important. Um, and then, um, you know, maybe having someone else pay for it, like the caregiver sometimes to pay for it because it may be a financial issue. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there are ways that you can do this. And if really someone really is in danger and they can't and won't get help, there are two choices. One would be to call an adult protective services, and the other one would be to really look at placement because being at home is really not an option. Thank you, Donna. Unfortunately, we have to end our presentation on Caregiving 101, exploring the <clears throat> complexities of the caregiving. On behalf of the National Center on Caregiving, we thank you for joining us today. I would also like to thank our presenter, Donna Shemp. Um, and please feel free to, to visit us at <clears throat> excuse me caregiver.org to review archive material from this presentation, to access fact sheets or obtain information about future staff development series and webinars, and particularly when we begin our open forum series, which provides an opportunity for um, those of you who are working with families in this to really talk to one another uh, facilitated by um, a technical expert on the topic. As mentioned earlier, we'll be sending out a brief survey. We'd appreciate your feedback. And again, thank you for joining us today.